I was listening to talk radio again this morning. It's a weakness I apparently share with a lot of you. I enjoy listening to the verbal agility of the host and the absolute certainty with which he plunges into areas about which he clearly knows little or nothing. Today was a perfect example. Obesity was the subject and personal responsibility was the issue. I missed the top of the program, so it's entirely possible that it was prompted by the fact that ABC News and Time Magazine have devoted this entire week to the subject. We're calling it Critical Condition. America's obesity crisis. Anyway, I gather that my friend the radio host was put out by the notion that obesity might be the responsibility of anyone other than the obese person. Set aside the issue of genetics for a moment, he didn't really get into that. This was one of those classic rants about freedom and responsibility. We are all free, in other words, to eat whatever we want, and if we become grossly overweight, it is our own responsibility and nobody else's. Everyone who called in while I was listening at least loved that notion. Bluntly stated, if you're fat, it's your own damn fault. There is some truth to that, but if, for example, you are poor, live in the inner city, and have no transportation of your own, you are significantly more likely to be obese than if you are well off, drive your own car, and live in the suburbs. And while education does make a difference, it's not the key factor. Take a look at what Nightline producer Marie Nelson and correspondent Michelle Martin found. The Roman noodles are very popular here. They're 69 cents to get a six pack. Macaroni and cheese is four for a dollar. So it's things like that that helps them budget a little bit of money and also having enough groceries to last them at least a couple of weeks. At the Save-A-Lot store in Highland Park, a low-income neighborhood of Detroit, people are stocking up for the weekend. It is one of two grocery stores in this community of 17,000. But for many people here, this is the store they depend on. Easy to reach without a car, welcoming to those on a fixed income or public assistance. And the people who run it know what their customers need and want. Compared to what we offer for people that can't get out to the Costco, the Sam's Club, because there's none here in Detroit. There's none. So therefore, economy-wise, we do the best we can to help them. You know, I mean, taco shells, 99 cents. You know, Roman noodles. You buy a whole case for three dollars and some change. You know, it's a lot easier. People do that. They'll buy a whole oh, yeah. case. They'll of buy them. a whole case. They will buy okay. a whole case. Throughout history and in much of the world now, to be poor has meant to be thin, even painfully so. But not today, not in the United States at least, where those with the lowest incomes are far more likely to have the biggest waistlines. It's one of the great ironies of the obesity epidemic is that it affects the poor more than it affects the rich. Marion Nessel is director of public health initiatives at New York University. We see much higher rates of obesity among uh, poor people in inner cities, in rural areas, everywhere. And the irony, of course, comes from the fact that these are exactly the people who also have trouble getting enough food. So both things are going on at once. The Centers for Disease Control estimates that one out of four adults with incomes below the poverty level is obese. The correlation is especially true for women. Those with incomes below the poverty level are more than twice as likely to be obese as women with the highest incomes. If you want to lose weight, you got to cut calories too. Low income Americans certainly aren't the only ones struggling with their weight. Weight loss has become a huge industry in the U.S. after all. I lost 180 pounds. It's not coming back. But the link between low income and obesity is unmistakable in less affluent areas all over the country where people are getting fatter and sicker as a result. We see type 2 diabetes. We see stroke, cardiovascular disease or heart disease. We see osteoarthritis. Dr. Kimberly Dawn Wisdom, the country's only state-level surgeon general, says a whole series of gradual social changes have conspired to make people fatter. Our portion sizes have changed, so people are actually eating more. They're eating more uh, fat, fatty foods, as well as foods that are calorie dense. And also our environment. I think with uh, we've sort of systematically engineered physical activity out of our environments, and uh, so many people, instead of walking to school or biking to school or walking to stores, are actually uh, getting into cars and traveling very short distances. But others say the link between poverty and obesity is far more direct. Well, some people say that obesity is the result of a low metabolism. 
I say it really is the result of low wages. Dr. Adam Drudnowski is director of the Center for Public Health and Nutrition at the University of Washington. People always raise the issue of personal responsibility and freedom of choice. And they say if only the obese people made the right choices, if only they exercised, all would be well. What I say is this. People's choices are very effectively limited by their economic circumstances. So in other words, obesity is predicted not so much by metabolism and genetics, it is actually very reliably predicted by zip code. To test that theory, we went to Detroit, named America's fattest city by Men's Fitness Magazine this year, based on such factors as the number of exercise facilities and fast food outlets. Give me the scope of the problem here in Michigan. How bad is it? Well, it's pretty bad. Uh, as a state, we about 62% of our adult population is either overweight or obese. And that has been increasing over about the last 10 years. Civic leaders like Detroit Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick are so concerned they have kicked off a citywide campaign to encourage healthier habits. A healthy community, you know, grows economically, culturally, socially, and we want Detroiters to be healthy. Most of the people we talk to here have gotten the message that they need to watch their weight. They need to do things like eat more fresh fruit and vegetables. But for many of them, that's easier said than done. And I, oh, I know I'm <laughs> Well, I, I wasn't going to ask. I wasn't going to ask. Where do you get your fruits and vegetables? Do you have are those widely available, or is, uh, can you find you know, what you need? You have to go out most of the time. It's not a whole lot of the city. And I tend to go to the fruit markets like Randazzle, you know, and uh, there's one in Dearborn, I go out there. But what if you didn't have a car? Oh, then you're hit. Yeah, you have to make do with what's around. Fresh produce does cost more and there is really no aggregate buying power in the neighborhood to buy luxury items on a regular basis. So what you do see in low-income neighborhoods is lots of grains, cereals, sweetened cereals, added sugars, and added fat. If you're in one of these areas, you just don't have any options. You, you have liquor stores, you have corner stores that might sell a few little things, you've got bodegas in Hispanic areas that might sell a few packaged foods. What you don't have is the kind of choice and opportunity that people in wealthier areas have. How much does this cost? You know, my uh, I think that's 99 cents. 99 cents for So 99 cents each is how much is this? 2 99 A lot of places, they milk is 3 Three fifty. Oh, some other stuff. That just has a lot of sugar in it. But well, once you once you water, put a little water. You in water it down. Yes. You water it down, and it's cheaper than the milk. So you get three of those for the same price yeah, as right. one of these. If you have five dollars and you go into McDonald's, you can buy five hamburgers at one dollars each or one salad. If you're poor, which are you going to choose? The answer is obvious.